to uh, the ring oscillator that I have built um, myself. Now, one other test that I want to do is I want to test the effect of uh, temperature on uh, the frequency variation of crystal and also the ring oscillator. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do that in a simple way. First, I'm going to only connect one of these guys. So here's my crystal oscillator. I've disconnected everything else. I'm going to connect the crystal oscillator to the frequency counter again, and then we will look at the frequency counter. So right now, the frequency counter is saying the same thing, 3.999968. Now, I want to cool this by about uh, maybe 30 or 40 degrees Celsius and see how much effect that has on uh, the, the frequency of oscillation. So how am I going to cool it? I'm going to cool it using this. Using this thing. One of these uh, uh, dusters. Now, usually, this guy just uh, blows compressed uh, gas to blow off dust. But if you hold it upside down, uh, the, the liquid that's inside here, which, is com which evaporates when it's the right side up, if I hold it upside down, then the liquid will flow through here and come out. Now the boiling temperature of this liquid is very low, maybe minus 30 or minus 40 degrees Celsius. So if I blow some of that liquid onto the chip, I can lower its temperature significantly. So I'm just going to hold it like that, and then I'm going to press it, and then it's going to go all over this, and it's going to actually freeze and frost. So I'm going to first point the camera at the frequency counter so you can see it. Then I will do what I'm doing right now, and I will um, spray some of this on it, and then we can see how much it changes. And then I'll bring the camera back on this so you can see it frozen. Here we go. Still 3.99. 9968. Nine, so I'm going to now do, let me see right here, I'm going to do what I said. So about to spray it now. Right? So you can see it changed by um, not a whole bunch, about 30 or 40 or so hertz. So now that the part is frozen, and you can see the frequency is slowly shifting back and forth because the temperature is now more and more stabilizing. So now the part is actually frozen. So let me see if I can get it in camera so you can see the part frozen. There it is. You can see there is uh, some, some frost on it. This guy can focus. There it is. It's actually, right now, it's, yes, you can see it's uh, melting now. So the frequency will now stabilize again around what it was once uh, the temperature goes back to room temperature. So I want to do exactly the same thing with this circuit. I'm going to uh, spray the same liquid on it and um, we're going to look at the measure, measured results to see how much the temperature changes. So remember the, cham the temperature of this crystal oscillator changed by about 20-30 hertz or so as it changed 30 degrees in temperature. So let's do the same thing and see, uh, let's see the difference. So here's the crystal is still connected, so I'm going to disconnect the crystal. And I'm going to connect Okay, there it is, 3.938, just like before, and we can see it going all over the place. And I'm going to spray it again with the same thing, lower its temperature, and let's see what happens. So remember, 3.936. How about that? Shifted by almost, well, actually now, more than half, oh it's still going, 4.6, 4.6, uh, is it going to reach 4.7? No, it's going to start going back now. So it changed by more than half a megahertz. Again, tens of thousands of times worse than what we just saw the crystal do. So again, yet another reason why we, uh, why it is so important to appreciate the difference between these crystals and why they're everywhere in compared to building them building the circuits from solid states so and I can see this one is going to slowly start to melt as well. So a huge difference in performance 
between these two uh, type of circuits. Now, what can we do further to um, eliminate these type of temperature coefficients or temperature effects on the crystal oscillators themselves? Even though the crystal performs so well, it was still so much. It's still so much worse than what we want them to. Be. We want them to be so close to be at their ideal value. So th what? What do people do? Well, people do some fancy things. For example, they built crystal oscillators uh, that look like this. If I can get one of these guys out, so I can show you. They built them so they look like this. Now this guy is what's called a TCXO, a temperature compensated crystal oscillator, meaning that inside this there is circuitry that measures the ambient temperature and when it measures the ambient temperature it will then adjust the crystal oscillator the circuits that are around the crystal to compensate for the temperature effect so they know how much the, the crystal will change with respect to temperature they have characterized it and then they will change the biasing or they put a reactor there or do something to the circuit to adjust the frequency depending on the measured temperature. So this guy can have a lot less drift as a function of temperature. Now you can take this even further. You can build them so that they look like this. This guy has a built-in oven. This one is called an OCX, so an oven-controlled crystal oscillator. So the oven inside this turns on and heats up the crystal to a predetermined temperature, let's say 85 degrees Celsius. And it keeps the whole thing, this whole thing, at 85 degrees Celsius so that no matter what the ambient temperature is, the crystal is always at a constant 85 degrees Celsius. That way, uh, it doesn't matter anymore uh, how the system, how, where it is operated. If you put this outside and the temperature outside is minus 10 degrees Celsius, you're supposed to stay at 85. And so if it's under the sun and it's at 60 degrees Celsius, it will still stay at 85 degrees. So therefore, the frequency will not drift with respect to time. So this is a yet this is a, the, the more expensive and uh, of course aim for more uh, critical applications. You can take it even one step further and build this guy, which is the biggest crystal oscillator I have ever seen. This is a, again an oven controlled crystal oscillator, but this is instrument grade. I've taken this out of an instrument, out of the, um, a measurement instrument, an Agilent part, I think it was. And the, what this does extra is that this also filters the output of the oscillator and it gives you only a single tone so it has very spectral purity so it gives you if it says 10 megahertz there's only a tone at 10 megahertz its phase noise is very low its drift is very very low because it has, a, it has an oven built into it and but the disadvantage this thing consumes a lot of power at 12 volts it burns 700 milliamps until it warms up. Once it reaches a temperature, it burns another 180 or 200 millivolts, milliamps constantly from 12 volts, but it gives you a lot of amplitude and it can drive a 50 ohm load. So this is obviously meant for RF applications. So one of these guys is inside this instrument right here. Also, one is of course inside uh, the spectrum analyzer. So Therefore, that, that's why these guys can do such accurate measurements because they have a very accurate reference. Without this guy, you wouldn't be able to do that. In fact, there is also one of these in my uh, function generator because this guy needs to synthesize frequencies very accurately and uses this as a reference. We were looking at this and I thought that, well, just to make everything complete, let's, let's quickly measure this so you, so you can see the output coming from it. Uh, this uh, video ended up being a lot longer than I thought, so I hope you're still watching. So what I'm going to do is that I know that this guy runs from 12 volts and I've already labeled the pins on it. So it has an output, uh, the ground, the VDD. It also has an enable pin so you can disable or enable the output of this while it's powered up. That can be very important in some systems. And it also has an adjust pin. Uh, you can adjust the frequency of this by maybe about 10 hertz, um, align it uh, if it's uh, not perfect when you get it or if it's aging and due to some other effects the frequency has shifted. So you can see how accurate these things need to be that I can uh, adjust the frequency of this in, in sub hertz values to get it exactly at 10 megahertz. So let's power this up. I'm going to do that by, uh, by setting the power supply to, to uh, 12 volts. So now it's actually on and enabled. So I'm going to enter 12 volts 
and you can see it's now 12 volts, it's not connected to anything, so I'm going to turn it off. And I'm going to connect it to my circuit. So here's uh, VDD, here's ground, I've connected that, and I'm connecting the output like so, and I'm also connecting the grounds together, like that. So it has a pull-up uh, resistor and, and enable, so it's enabled uh, unless you apply a pull-down value on it. So I'm going to turn it on, and it's cold now, because it's been sitting at room temperature, so as soon as I enable it, I will see um, the, the, the total power including the oven. So here we go, there it is, and there it is, it's picking up. So right now it's consuming 560 milliamps, 6.7 watts, and it's beginning to uh, warm up. And as time passes, and as it warms up, the power consumption will slowly drop because the oven doesn't need to be on as much anymore to, keep the, to maintain the temperature, and it's going to produce um, the kind of uh, the, the sinusoid that I was telling you that this thing produces a very clean tone. So let's take a look at the output. Here we go, so we can take a look at the, the signal, here it is, you can see it's uh, very much sinusoidal, not like the square wave we were looking at before, it also is a, a round zero, so it has a positive and it swings positive and negative, and it looks like a very nice sinusoid, quite different uh, from what we were seeing before from the other crystal oscillators, and the frequency is of course 10 megahertz, which is what's written on the part itself. Now that now it's been on for a while, so um, you can see it right there, it's been on for a while, it's, it's now quite hot, it's uh, at about 85 degrees Celsius. And if I look at the power consumption, now it's much less. So this is after it's been on for a while, the oven temperature has stabilized, and now this is just a, a transient um, the power consumption of it, it's about 2 watts. This is what it's going to burn the whole time while it's operating. So, um, we can see that uh, something like this, obviously takes a lot of space and it's quite expensive. These things can be hundred, two hundred dollars just for a single uh, oscillator like this, but they may be necessary depending on the kind of application that uh, they're used for. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. It ended up being a lot longer than I thought. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe and rate the videos on YouTube so that we can um, finally get uh, become a, a YouTube partner and, and not have to split the videos into so many parts, especially this one. So I hope that you stuck around and uh, watched the whole thing and let us know what you think.